In 2012, my, my daughter graduated from college with a teaching degree. While searching for a position, she eventually found one in the Bloomington School District. Uh, but while searching, she took a job at the child care center at the Veterans Hospital, not far from here. And a good friend who she had worked there and had given a good recommendation, and so she got the job. During that season of her life, she was living at home with us. And I could always tell when she had spent the day working with that particular friend. Um, there was just signs that she had, uh, she had been working with that friend. The way she talked actually gave it away. It was her, her talking. Uh, I could hear her friends phrasing, pausing, uh, and intonation of certain words. And on many days, I'd say, you spent the day with Jen, didn't you? And then the first couple times she looked at me and said, well, why do you ask? And I said, well, I can, I can just tell. And then later when I'd ask, she'd just look annoyed. And uh, now I want you to know it wasn't a bad thing at all. Her friend was and is a really great young lady. It was just a remain thing. It was a remain thing. See, when we remain with someone, we obviously tend to pick up certain things, possibly uh, the way they talk, but more often I think we pick up the way they think, attitudes they have, opinions they have, viewpoints, worldview, all kinds of things, when we just remain with people. Uh, we're in a sermon series, as many of you know, here at Oak Hills Church. It's just called Remain. And the goal of the series is to discover what happens. It's a real simple goal. We're just trying to figure out what happens when we remain in a relationship with Jesus. What happens to us? when we remain in a relationship with Jesus? What attitudes, what opinions will we have? What words and phrases will we use? How will we see others? How will we view others? Uh, how will we treat others? How will we judge others? And how will they see us? So to find out, we're studying a section of the Bible known as the Farewell Dis uh, Discourse. And it comes from the Gospel of John. It's in the New Testament. There's a section where Jesus, it's kind of this long goodbye, this farewell discourse, where he is saying goodbye. He's telling them that he's about to leave them. And it's in this section. So we're looking at the first 17 verses of John 15, where we read how Jesus encouraged his disciples. It's just 17 verses where he's, he asks them and, he's, and he encourages them to remain in him. Now, other translations use the word abide. So Jesus says, abide in me. Remain in me. Um, today, of course, um, our focus is on this one idea of love. And um, we're going to talk more specifically or as specifically as we can about what it really means to have authentic love. Like authentic love. What is that? Authentic kind of love. Um, thankfully, in the two verses we're going to look at, Jesus actually gives, we'll call them guideposts or some guidelines to this idea and the subject of love. And the reason I say thankful is because, as I mentioned as I began, I mean, the subject of love is so vast, and it's talked about and written about, um, and it's just huge. Like, if you just start with the Christian faith, for example, probably no idea more talked about, no sermons more preached on than the love of God. And uh, only coming in a close second, especially talked about in, with Christians or preached on by, by pastors, coming in second would just be how much we are supposed to love others. So those two topics alone just dominate sermons, and they should. The Bible's full of it. But then, of course, outside of the faith, the subject of love is even, I think, more popular it's estimated that there have been well over, get this, 100 million love songs written and recorded. 100 million. Uh, Hallmark Channel closed out 2022 as the most watched entertainment cable network of the year in key demographics. How many of you will admit right now that you watch the Hallmark Channel? Just go ahead, admit it. Okay. Many of you just lied. And so, um, <laughs> I, I like those movies sometimes. As a matter of fact, um, one of the girls that grew up in our church is, has been on, I think, four of them now, stars in four of those movies. But books and articles on falling in love, improving love, extending love to others, growing love, and they're always, 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 no matter what year it is, no matter what time it is, they're always popular. And then there's this, the research about love, which it has revealed a couple things, way more than these, but these 
are the ones I thought I'd share with you. Being in love cuts headache frequency in half. Uh, being in love saves you money on trips to the doctor. Being in love helps you heal faster. Love lowers your blood pressure, and it makes you more empathetic and in tune with your emotions. Actually, love makes you live longer. And it's statistically, scientifically proven that you'll live longer when you're truly in love. I was talking years ago now, I was talking to a counselor friend of mine. Um, I, he actually was a counselor of mine, and uh, he uh, counseled me on many things, was super helpful to me. And uh, I was talking to him about uh, narcissism. <laughs> and I, I actually, he brought it up. I was talking about a situation where I was dealing with somebody, and I was explaining this person, and he said to me, he probably is a narcissist. And I said, narcissist, you know, I've heard that before. I think I know what that means, but what, what are you saying? He said, well, it's, it's actually a psychological diagnosis. It's called narcissistic personality disorder. And it was the first time in my life I'd ever realized, okay, this is something that people just have. It's a mental illness. They become narcissists. And then since then, of course, I've seen all kinds of articles on it. I don't know if I just noticed them or if there are more. But there, you probably know this if you've studied it. There are many signs of being a narcissist. You can check yourself here, <laughs> as I've been doing lately. And, uh, but one, one is they're just totally, extremely self-absorbed. Everything's about them. And the other one is they, they are unable to feel empathy for others. They just can't. So that was years ago, I had that conversation, bring it up to more recently, like in the last couple of weeks. I don't know how this came about, but I was, Melody and I were talking together. That's my wife, Melody. We started talking about narcissism and narcissists. And I was thinking about this. I think I had just read it again, that they, narcissists have trouble showing empathy. They can't do it. And uh, I, I have uh, thought about the early years of ministry and youth ministry. I was a youth pastor, as many of you know, for 15 years. I was like the best in the nation. But anyway, um, <laughs> I did have trouble with authentic empathy for people. I, I did. And I didn't know it. Somebody might say, this person died or this person was sick or whatever. I don't think it truly went in here. I think it was like, well, that's somebody else. That's something else. You know, that, that doesn't have anything to do with me. And in this conversation with, and, and I will say that, thankfully, with the help of Jesus, um, that, that's changed. My heart goes out to so many things now. And I'm able, I feel like, to be empathetic. But I was, in this conversation with Melody, I was thinking about, I wonder if I was, had those tendencies, like if I was narcissistic. And everything was about me. You know, maybe not. I don't know. But I have been plenty selfish in my life, and I have uh, certainly loved myself quite a bit. I think most of us deal with um, self-absorption issues to a degree, and I think many of us deal with lack of empathy. So I do believe, and I'm going to tell you why I talked about this in a minute, I do believe all of us want to be loving people. We want to love others. We want to be empathetic. I think every one of us would like to have authentic love, like real God kind of love. Um, but here's the question of the day. I mean, is another sermon going to help us? Is another love song going to help us? Another book? What's going to help us to really love? So here's, here's what I just want to lay before you. What if just by, just by, remaining in Jesus, we were able to really love, authentically love others. What if it was that simplistic? If we just remained in Jesus. What if we begin to understand the essence of love and the emptiness of self-love just by remaining in Jesus? And here's what we've been saying in this series. This is where you start to remain. Because sometimes people hear, remain in Jesus. What does that mean? Well, it goes back, if you went to Sunday school, it goes back to when you were in Sunday school. When you were in Sunday school, your teacher said, you should read your Bible and pray. You should read your Bible and pray. 
Remaining in Jesus is reading your Bible and praying personally. You read your Bible. You remain in the written word. And then you pray. You talk to Jesus. And you remain in the living word. And that's where you start. If you want to know where you start, that's where you start. And if when you do that regularly in remaining in Jesus, you learn how to do it not just during those 5 or 10, 15 minutes when you do that. You, you begin to learn how to do it on a daily basis. You, you remain in Jesus you know, throughout your day. And it becomes this very powerful thing. So what we're going to do now is we're going to lead, read our scripture for today. And I want you to note something that Jesus outlines for us in his talk to his disciples in these two verses. He outlines what I, I would say he's outlining two kinds of love. The first kind of love we all get for free. It's the love we receive. So you'll hear it in a minute. First kind of love is one we all get for free. And then the second kind of love we get when we remain in Jesus. So two different things. This is John 15, 9, and 10. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. So as we've been doing throughout this series, what we're going to do is dig deeper now. We're just going to take these two phrases, I put it in two parts, and we're going to look at each one and dig a little deeper. So let's go back and talk about that first line. And this is the unconditional love. I said two kinds of love. So unconditional, agape love, it's the Greek word agape, it's unconditional. No conditions on love. And this is the kind of love that everybody gets for free. And Jesus said, I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. He was talking about the love of the Father for him was unconditional love. Now here is the first kind of love and the, and the one that we need to, first of all, really understand and embrace. The love of the Heavenly Father for us. Um, every human gets this one for free, this unconditional love of God. God loves us all unconditionally. If you think of it, think about this. I know you've heard it. There's nothing you can do to stop being unconditionally loved by God. Absolutely nothing you can do, think, or say to stop the love of God. The Apostle Paul wrote about this, and I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And that last line is really important. That is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So this unconditional love is revealed by remaining in Jesus. We have it. Everybody has the unconditional love of God. Not everybody knows it, maybe even wants it, but it's really revealed. Its character, what it really is, is revealed when we remain in Jesus. So it's this simple. God loves all of us unconditionally, but not everyone knows that or believes that or even cares about that. So God's love is fully revealed in this line. When we come into a relationship and remain in Jesus. Um, some of you know that the last 10 days, we, my wife Melody and I, we've been taking care of our grandchildren. One is one and a half, and the other one is six. Uh, we'll talk about learning to love. I've been having to learn to love uh, them this week. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> my uh, granddaughter, who's six, we were on the front porch this week, and um, I was a student, <clears throat> and then the other student was the one-and-a-half-year-old, Luca, and we were on the swing in the front porch, and she was pointing to an imaginary blackboard. And she was like, okay, what is this letter? And what is this letter? And what is this letter? And she had like eight letters. And I thought I did good. I, a, P, Z, I, I did them all. And she got done, and I said, how did I do? And she said, you didn't do well at all, Papa. <laughs> and she said, in fact, everyone else passed, and you didn't. You failed. And then she took an imaginary badge, and she put it on my chest, and she was like, 
and you have to wear this badge that said, I failed alphabet test. <laughs> I thought, what is this girl going to become in her life? <laughs> okay, thanks for letting me tell that one grandfather story. Um, but taking care of our kids reminded me of one of my nephews, who's now in his 40s. But when he was very little, uh, but he was well into the time when he could talk. <clears throat> uh, he, he just didn't talk. He wouldn't talk. Um, and eventually, of course, he started talking. Was, he was about 30 when he started talking, but <laughs> he, he talks all the time now. And he's, he started talking, but... It was just the funniest thing, and today I still smile about it. I get the biggest kick out of this kid. His name's Brandon. He's a great kid. Um, what, ha- what would happen is he'd come over to you and stand in front of you and just stare at you. And, uh, and so you felt like you should talk to him. And so you'd say, Brandon, how are you doing today? He'd just stare at you. He'd say, did you have fun today? Did you play today? He'd just stare. What's your name? Would you tell me something? He'd, he wouldn't. And the, what I always got the biggest kick out of was... I always felt like he was standing there looking at you going, I know you're talking to me. I know you're asking me questions. But I feel no obligation to respond to you. I don't owe you anything. I'm just standing here. It just always made me smile because I felt like he was like, keep talking. I'm not going to respond. So application. Application. Maybe, maybe God smiles as well when he keeps showing people his love who don't care about him. Maybe, they, maybe God just smiles and just keeps sharing his love, talking to them. And these people, maybe they never feel as though they need to respond or acknowledge or admit the love of God. And God has certainly given everyone the right to do that. No one has to acknowledge the love of God. No one has to receive the love of God. We don't have to do that. And maybe God just keeps smiling, saying, get a kick out of you. I'm just going to keep loving you. So note now what Jesus says. As the Father has loved me, that's how I love you. Okay? So as the Father has loved me, that's how I love you. And so now Jesus tells us about the kind of love we can have when we remain in him. So we have this unconditional love. That's something we get for free. Now, here's the one where we we go, okay, now we can have this kind of love if we remain in Jesus. So we can have that kind of love. At least get a taste of it. At least begin to experience that kind of love when we remain in Jesus. And here's that second part of that verse. When you obey my commandments, it's interesting, commandments come in here. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love. Just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. Isn't it interesting, with love comes the word commandments. So I think we could misunderstand this verse. So let's make sure we don't misunderstand this passage of Scripture. Hear this. Obeying the commandments of God does not earn God's love. That's unconditional. We just talked about that. Obeying God's commandments, however, are a result of remaining in God's love. So when we remain in God's love, what we find ourselves doing is obeying the commandments of God. So remaining in Jesus will result in a couple of things. First of all, full, fully realizing God's unconditional love for us. And it, it's fully realized, folks, when we come to Jesus. When we come into this relationship with Jesus, the, the awesomeness, the, the beauty of God's love for us is revealed to us. Like, like, no other way can, other than in a relationship with Jesus. And then as we remain in Jesus, the second thing that happens is then we then begin to demonstrate a kind of love to others that God has toward others. And I think this has been the frustration about love, and maybe you'd agree with me. How does one authentically love others? This has been the frustration, and I just, I'll just talk about a couple angles on this. But it's easy to talk about love. It's easy to embrace romantic love. Someone said when you're falling in love, it's like a drug. And it's, it's just so easy to show it. And then it becomes a challenge. And it's that challenging part that people have tried to deal with. So pastors preach about it. Artists 
sing about it, write about it. Psychologists try to diagnose this kind of different kind of love other than feeling love. Uh, and so uh, a couple of artists that I thought about in preparing this message, one was by a group, a Christian group called DC Talk. Anybody heard of DC Talk? Okay. So they, they had a song called Love, L-U-V is a verb. Words come easy but don't mean much when the words they're saying, we can't put trust. We're talking about love in a different light, and if we all learned to love it, would be just right. And uh, I felt like my, uh, I was, my, my son was really into DC Talk, so I heard a lot of their music. But I remember this song and hearing this song and thinking, this is a, a Christian group who love Jesus, and they're trying to deal with this challenge of authentically loving. And so they're dealing with this next step where it's not no longer feeling love, it's this action love. And so it's, it's love is a verb. It's action. It's doing something. Um, and so maybe, maybe he was asking, maybe we ask the questions as Christians, you know, we kind of have, I don't know, I've said this, and I have continued to say it, but lately I've been thinking I don't want to say it. You know, we have this talk about the love of God. We don't, we, we say, um, love, love the people, not the sin. You know, hate, or hate the sin, love the sinner. You probably said that. Well-meaning, you've said it. And so, so we easily say this. We usually say, you know, I love this person. Um, do we really? And, and what, how can we experience God kind of love in us that really is authentic? And it's that God kind of love through us to others that's real. How do we do that? Well, here's one artist who was trying to deal with that. There's another guy. I don't, I don't know about his faith. Uh, his name's John Mayer. And he wrote a lot of songs. Anybody heard of John Mayer before? Okay. Anybody a fan? Uh, okay. I'm a fan of his. Uh, he wrote a, ver- a song called Love is a Verb. It ain't a thing. It's not something you own. It's not something you scream. And then he repeats, love ain't a thing. Love is a verb. And at the very end, he says, you got to show it, show it, show it, show it, show it. I was at a, 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 did a, officiated a wedding a couple weeks ago. And uh, it was beautiful, it was in Colorado, and, and it was just fun to be with people, and it was so great. And there was an older couple there, older than me even, and, uh, and I was talking to this one guy, and he, he was like, oh, there wasn't this, isn't this great, and aren't this wedding great? And I said, yeah, it's so great, it's so beautiful. He said, I said, so how long have you been married? He was an older guy. And uh, he said, I've been married for seven years. And, he had, and his older wife was there. I said, really? He said, you know, uh, my first wife and I were married for 50-some years, and she passed away. And then I found this beautiful lady, and we've been married seven years. And he, said, and he pulled me close, and he said, you know what my dad said to me before I got married? What? <laughs> he said, you know, you can't just love. It's not a 50-50 thing when you get married. It's 100%. You don't, you don't just do 50. It's not an even thing. You just love 100%. He said, that was the best advice anybody ever gave me. I said, it's good advice. I've heard that before, and I like it. And I told him that honestly. I think it is good advice. And if you're married, you know what that means. But you know what? I think we still sometimes, when we're given 100%, we go, I don't know. I think I'm giving more. Or I'm not sure I like it that much this kind of effort toward love. I'm not sure I really like that idea. It's effort for love. So we've been trying to figure this out. Like, can we really have this unconditional love that, that flows out of us instead of this self-love, the selfish love, which we all know ends, ends in incredible emptiness. And so why do we go for that? So here you have these artists, love is a verb, it's action, and clearly, Jesus points out something important. And I think this is one of the keys. It's an interesting angle on this. For those of us who follow Jesus, I mentioned it earlier, as you and I remain in his love, we will obey the commandments. I think this is a key in this verse. 
we will obey the commandments. And what I said, I really believe. We don't earn, I, Scripture's full of it. We do not earn the love of God by obeying the commandments, but remaining in God's love, we obey the commandments. There's still something missing there, though, isn't there? Well, I love you, so I'll do it. I think there's something more powerful, deeper. I think there's something that happens in our spirit when we remain in Jesus. And our, our agape kind of love gets a chance to actually expand in our heart. And the commandments are not like, okay, I'll do it. We begin to obey the commandments out of this base and motivation of love just because we just love to do it. There's something else. It's beyond our head and mind. It's something spiritual, and it's something powerful. And so that's why I think it's so important, and there's a danger in this. And the danger is, um, as we remain in God's love, and we think about ourselves as Christians, I think we need to evaluate then, so we can just kind of check ourselves. Like, how, how am I doing on this love thing? So let me give you some examples. If we don't remain in Jesus, and here's, here's where I'm headed with this sort of final thought. If we don't remain in Jesus, I know this from personal experience, I know this in my own life, if we don't remain in Jesus, then we might pick and choose who and what we love. And we might pick and choose, if we don't remain in Jesus, which commandments we obey. And let me give some examples of what I'm talking about, especially in the present culture in which we live in America. So this is the danger of remaining outside of Jesus. We're going to maybe pick and choose. So let's, let's, let's just say, let's just talk about Christians. And there's different types of Christians. So I'm going to talk about two types of Christians. There's some Christians, they pick the commandments because they're going to obey the commands of Jesus. They're Christians, they're going to obey the commands of Jesus. So they pick the commandments about sexuality and morality to obey. And then, for some reason, maybe are okay with ignoring the commands about the poor or the injustices in the world. Maybe they, me, I'm not trying to pick on anybody, but maybe we notice, we don't even notice some other things that they're so far gone, we don't even know we're not obeying the commandments, like regularly violating the commandments of God by loving money, by gossiping, by hating by having hate. So it's, it's really interesting how if we don't remain in Jesus, we can go, I'm obeying the commands. I'm obeying the commands. But we kind of pick and choose. Oh, this one, this one, this one. I don't really see the others. Of course, then you have maybe a different kind of Christian. The opposite is true as well. If they don't remain in Jesus, if we don't remain in Jesus, we, may, we might obey the commands about social issues and taking care of the poor and standing up for justice. But then we might ignore the biblical commands about sexuality and about human life. Tim Keller wrote this, when you come to Christ, you must drop your conditions. You have to give up the right to say, I will obey you if, I will do this if. As soon as you say, I will obey if, that is not obedience at all. You are saying, you are my advisor, not my Lord. I will be happy to take your recommendations and I might even do some of them. No, if you want Jesus with you, you have to give up the right to self-determination. Self-denial is an act of rebellion against our late modern culture of self-assertion. But that is what we are called to, nothing less. Remaining in Jesus, folks, is our best bet at living what we are called to as followers of Jesus. And Jesus says, remain in me, remain specifically in my love. You might know that John authored another verse of Scripture, uh, another passage in the New Testament, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And this is 1st John 4, 7. John wrote, dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. And anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is is 
love. The ultimate sign that we are followers of Jesus is our love. It really is. There might be all kinds of stuff we're doing. There might be all kinds of commandments we're obeying. (laughs) We might even be known as a really great Christian. But the ultimate test is our love. Do we love like God loves? And the very best way to love as Jesus called us to love, as I said, is to remain in Jesus. And I've said this, I think, every week, but can we even imagine what would happen in our families, in our personal lives, what would happen in our church if we all committed to be people who remain in Jesus? Could we even imagine what would happen in this church and the testimony of this church and the kind of love that we have? Let's pray together. And while we take a few minutes to pray, why don't we invite the Holy Spirit to come and make this personal, will you? Just say, Holy Spirit, come. I pray, Holy Spirit, you come right now and fill this house as you have today. And folks, let's all just tell Jesus that we want to remain in him and we truly want to begin to fully realize the love of God for us, but also we want to have remaining love and a God kind of love for others. Just to invite Jesus to come and show you how to love. Jesus, we come to you today I know that every one of us who are gathered here watching online as well, I know it's our desire that we would truly love as you love. That's, that's the heart of everybody here. And we, we pray that you take us to a new place, reveal to us new insight, take us to a new place of understanding and remaining so much in your love that it's just part of us. It's just who we are. And as we leave this place today, I just pray that you would not only do that, but that you'd just show us those who we encounter or those in our lives who who we would demonstrate that to because of remaining in you. pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. As uh, Melody and I recently watched a a film, and uh, it's called The Jesus Revolution. And it was very interesting to me because uh, although I wasn't old enough to experience this in full, what that movie is about. I was just, just in junior high school and behind what was happening in the Jesus Revolution in the 60s, late 60s and into 70s. It was a very interesting movie and I enjoyed it very much and I was reminded of a number of things. In fact, I looked up a, a singing group that I realized I loved as a junior higher actually called Love Song. And uh, I listened to all their music and I was like, I know all these songs, I I love this group. But anyway, what it reminded me of is something that I say pretty much every week and it reminded me again of something I really believe. And that is that our, when you become a Christian, there is a decision you and I make to become a Christian. The salvation of Jesus is offered to us for free, but you have to reach out and take it. 
you have to be at least reach out and receive it. And so I just want, I just felt led to just say this to, to you today and some of you watching. You know, sometimes we think we're just Christians because, I don't know, we go to church or because we, we just think we are. And, uh, and, it's, and there is this time where you have to just say, Jesus, I want to personally tell you I believe in you. I want to receive you as my Lord and Savior. I want to ask you to forgive me of my past and my sin. I want you to come in and be Lord of my life. And I want to follow you and remain in your love. We make that decision. And, uh, and so if you've never done that, I want to pray right now. So we're going to pray again. Okay, just let's bow our heads together. And those watching online, you too, or maybe you're watching later in the week, or maybe it's a month or two after this, but this is just for you. But if you've never, ever personally just had a prayer and just said, you know, Jesus, I really do believe in you. I believe you're the Son of God, the one and only God. And I, I want to tell you that I want to receive you into my heart, my life, as my Lord and Savior. And I ask you to forgive me of my past and my sin and to cleanse me. And I want to make you Lord of my life. I want to follow you. I want to remain in you. So Lord, I pray for those who, for the very first time, they made that decision to follow you. And I pray that they would begin to experience that kind of life that comes to us when we remain in our relationship with you. And I thank you. Amen. Amen. So one of the reasons we have uh, people like Donnie and Jenny over here uh, every, every Sunday is because they're here to pray. And a lot of times people do what we just did. You know, you just receive Jesus in your heart. One of the best things you can do is come and pray with somebody. And so if you just did that today, I want to encourage you to come right down. Let them pray with you just before you go. Or if you came in today with a particular need, um, there's something on your heart, there's somebody you love, somebody you know who needs prayer, don't hesitate. Come and ask them to pray. It's power as we combine with others with faith and pray. And so just take a minute um, and come down and pray, okay? The other thing you can do is you go to our website, you go to Connect, and then you st- scroll down to prayer, uh, prayer and Care, and you give us your prayer request. We'll pray for you. As we did this last Wednesday at 10 o'clock, we gather right here, our staff, and we pray for every need. And so we'll pray for you this week. The other thing is, if today was a day that you received Jesus in your heart and uh, you want to know more about that, what that means, you go to Connect and you scroll down to Follow Jesus. And we'll give you some insight into what it means and some tools on uh, remaining in Jesus. Okay? Now next week, we're going to talk about another great topic. Jesus says when we remain in him, Not only do we experience authentic love, but we experience authentic joy. Joy. Like real joy. Not circumstantial joy. And so we're going to talk about that next week. And so I hope you'll join us. And uh, of course, you're all invited to join us for some coffee and uh, in the big room so we can connect. God bless you. Thanks for coming today. We'll see you.